Hello and welcome again to Gaming Gate House and into this playthrough of Mass Effect 2. So last time we went reading some emails and did also some upgrades to our equipment and to our team and now we're going to explore the Codex. Most of the Codex has already been uh, read and known about but there are some new entries and I am not the kind of guy that li likes to leave some things behind. Planets and locations, ships and vehicles, weapons, armor and equipment. Humans detected Iaea as an Earth-type world via telemetry in 2165. After probe surveys indicated life, lush vegetation, ample fresh water and breathable air, the Alliance upgraded the planet to a Garden World colonization priority. Commanded by Captain Ronald Taylor, the crew of Alliance survey vessel Hugo Gernsback made planetfall on the jungle world in 2173. Soon after, ship transmissions inexplicably stopped. While the precise fate of the Hugo Gernsback command and crew is unknown, they are presumed killed in action and their vessel destroyed. We already dealt with that question. Some were alive. Others were mentally handicapped due to the local flora. We already know. A typical, about. a regional hub of Asari commerce awash in riches, Ilium is infamous for its abusive labor practices and legalization of nearly everything except murder. As such, Ilium is the preferred production site for weapons and pharmaceuticals that would be illegal nearly everywhere else made even more lucrative by legal indentured servitude. Among the biotics-related pharmaceutical producers is the Dantius Corporation, a rising star in galactic commerce. Despite the dangers of its products, Ilium is renowned for glamour, luxury, and safety, provided by near-total surveillance, making it a favored tourist destination. Countless celebrities maintain palatial estates on Ilium and in its capital, Nos Astra. The sole obstacle to business on Ilium is its extensive bureaucracy, tolerated only for its provision of security. Regardless of the character of its economy, Ilium's self-congratulatory media exalts its own society with the provincial arrogance of new money, glorifying in sexiest CEOs and ten richest residents lists. Not a good place to live, no. I think. Originally an app, the Drell homeworld of Rakana once teemed with life. Its arid plains home to spectacular insect and reptile analogs. But the Drell took to industrialization early and did not realize the extent of the environmental damage they caused until it was too late. With their topsoil depleted and oceans too acidic to sustain life, the Drell were situated for a massive population crash by 2025 CE. It was then the Hanar stepped in, mounting a large-scale rescue operation to bring Drell to the Hanar homeworld, Kaje. As wars erupted over what resources remained on Rakana and billions began to die, approximately 375,000 Drell escaped in the exodus. To repay their debt, the Drell entered into an agreement with the Hanar. Called the Compact, it states, that the Drell would assist the Hanar with tasks the Hanar cannot physically perform. Today, high-ranking Hanar are frequently inseparable from their Drell attendants. 2025 seems an um, ominous year for certain species. Asari-made Solaris armor can resist even the tremendous heat and kinetic energy of starship weapons. The armor is nearly unsurpassed in strength because its central material, carbon nanotube sheets woven with diamond chemical vapor deposition, are crushed by mass effect fields into super dense layers able to withstand extreme temperatures. That process also compensates for diamond's brittleness. Diamond armor itself has two limiting disadvantages. First, while nanotubes and CVD diamond construction has become cheaper in recent years, it remains prohibitively expensive to coat starships or aircraft larger than fighters in Solaris material. 
Second, the armor must be attached to the ship's superstructure, so shockwaves from massive firepower can still destroy the metals beneath the armor itself. A popular misconception holds that the diamond composition of Solaris armor gives it its sparkle. In fact, atmospheric nitrogen impurities during the super-hot forging process give the armor its metallic gray or yellow sheen. Nice. That's all for With ships and the that. systems of Okay. Weapons, armor and equipment. The collector's pop the M920 cane is a portable particle yeah. accelerator surrounding an array of dust form element zero chambers. This weapon prototype subjects its ESO to extreme positive and negative currents to project mass effect fields. By increasing and decreasing mass, the fields shear the target's mass, the way disruptor torpedoes do. The shearing fields collide ambient materials at such high speeds, they create mushroom clouds, an effect otherwise impossible on the small scale. The weapon induces neither fission nor fusion in non-nuclear targets, and its own nuclear reactions are shielded by lead alloys. The M920 cane uses graphite rods as neutron moderators, which require frequent replacement to sustain power. Fortunately, most heavy weapon ammunition can be refabricated via Omni-Tool into graphite rods. My favorite heavy weapon, but I also like the, uh, the it's not here, the, M the, uh, the singularity weapon that fires a small black hole. Okay, now it's up to me to read about these new entries. I uh, guess then it's just yeah, sorry, Ardat Yakshi. Ardat Yakshi, demon of the night winds. Our sorry suffering from a genetic disorder preventing conventional melding of nervous system during mating. Instead, Ardat Yakshi electrochemically ravaged their partner's ner nervous systems, in extreme cases, leaving victims as ve vegetative invalids or corpses. A Sarib psychologists regard this incapacity for mental fusion as preventing the development of empathy, leading to psychopathy. There is no known cure. Mm. The disorder generally begins in infancy, reaching full pathology during maiden adolescent sexual development. While seductive and sexually driven as other Asari, Ardat Yakshi are congenital, congenitally sterile. I guess because of the uh, sense, the ability to reproduce depends on the nervous system. If the nervous system is not normal, I guess it's not able to. Ancient Asari mythology held Ardat Yakshi as gods of destruction, depicting them as villains of countless legends and as the anti-heroes of numerous, num numerous Asari epics. Contrary to popular belief, Ardat Yakshi are neither extremely rare, around 1% of Asari dwell or on the A Y spectrum, nor are they nor are they all murderers. Most cultivate and discard countless exploited, exploita, exploitative, exploitative or abusive relationships during their legally marginal lives. Despite rumors of Ardat Yakshi syndicates, by nature Ardat Yakshi are incapable of long-term cooperation. As a dis disproportionately, <coughs> lot of the hard words today. As a disproper as a disproper disproportionately, <coughs> as a disproportion disproportionately wealthy species, as are employed their economic reach and media ownership to hide the A Y pathology from the galactic community, placing most Ardat Yakshi in monitored work programs or seclusion, 
only the most aggressive cases are sentenced to sanitaria and prisons or to the execution lists of justicorps. Pity. That's it for alien council races. Extent non council races. Drell biology. Drell are omni. Om Drell are om omnivorous reptile like humanoids with an average lifespan of 85 galactic standard years. They give live birth to their young, who are capable of eating solid food from the moment they are born. Drell appearance is very similar to Asari and humans, but their muscle tissue is slightly denser than that of humans, giving them a wiry strength. Many of their more reptilian features are concealed, like a three-chambered heart with a muscular ridge that is capable of shunting oxygenated or deoxygenated blood as needed. One unique characteristic, however, is the hyoid bone in their throats, which allow them to inflate their throats and produce vocal sounds outside of, outside of the human range. Would-be assassins have noted that these two features make Drell extremely hard to strangle or suffocate. Oh. <coughs> because the Drell ancestors emerged from arid rocky deserts, the humid ocean-covered Hanar homeworld of Kajie proved tolerable only when the Drell stayed inside a climate-controlled dome city. Due to, due to this huge disparity in the two species' homeworld environments, the leading cause of death among drells on Kaje is a bacterial lung disease called Keppel syndrome. Within, within a generation of the drell's arrival on the planet, the disease has become resistant to han Hanar antibi anti antibi antibiotics and other advanced treatments. Once an infection settles in, death is slow but imminent. Transplants may, may by time. But as the infection spreads to other major organs, there comes a point of diminishing returns and eventual system failure. I mean, that's the problem of moving from a planet to, a, to another. You have to adapt. Any new planets and locations? The Migrant Fleet The flotilla, or the Migrant Fleet, is a fleet of roughly 50,000 starships that houses over 17 million quarians, the largest collection of sea starfaring vessels in the galaxy. The fleet is so large it may take days for all the ships to pass through a mass relay. 50,000 starships. The ships are constantly repaired, replaced and upgraded to comfortably house as many as quarrying as possible. Typically, ships specialize in roles for the fleet. From the enormous agricultural life ships to the shielded lab ships to the repurposed freighters known as home ships that house quarrying children, young parents and educators. Employed quarrians typically live in the ship they work on, since commuting from ship to ship ties up resources with unnecessary docking procedures. Proceed procedures. 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 The procedure. I'm saying this wrong. Procedures. Even within the flotilla, quarians on most ships will remain in case in their protective suits. Rarely, quarians will meet on clean ships for specific purposes as, as such as medical service or reproduction. When this occurs, when this occur, they remove their suits, knowing full well that it is likely they will spend a few days having allergic reactions or getting over infections as their weakened immu immune systems compensate for each other's presence. Ha! It's a lot of trust here. Ships I'm looking at a, a small help on the other screen to make sure I don't miss anything behind. <coughs> Ships and vehicles. D. 
the A61 meant his gunship, the workhorse of mercenary bands throughout the galaxy. The Mantis is a two-man vectored thrust aircraft that excels in close air support roles. Highly modular in construction, the Mantis can be reconfig reconfigured as a low-altitude gunship, a fighter, a high-altitude bomber, or even a single stage to orbit space plane that can engage enemy craft around the planet or space station. The only role that the Mantis cannot perform is that of a true deep space fighter as it has no FTL drive. First rolled off the assembly lines in 2170, the Mantis remains in service in dozens of armies across the galaxy. It is most commonly used as air support in pitched ground battles. In a configuration that supports two pods for Inferno PK PKRs, precision kill rockets, and the chin mountain M3350 mass accelerated cannon. Its kinetic barriers, thermal decoy system, and electronic countermeasures suit made the Mantis far less vulnerable to surface-to-air attacks than previous generations of aircraft. Like most modern planes, the Mantis uses an, uses an element zero core to ease the load of the engines with a mass effect field, allowing it to take off vertically or over in place using minimum, minimum, minimum fuel. This also gives its far greater range and speed than the helicopters and jump jet aircrafts that once fill its niche. A Mantis can take off from Baton Rouge, reach Moscow in a few hours, fly a ground attack mission and return home before having to refuel. Nice. Helios Thruster Module Intended for next generation fighter, fighter crafts, the Heat Industries Helios Thruster Model Propulsion System far outpaces the typical li liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen reactions that power a frigate's maneuvering thrusters. By using a metal stable metallic hydrogen, the Helios boasts a fuel that burns at a far greater efficiency than liquid H2O2. Navigators can execute the numerous small course corrections inherent to any long distance travel without fear of exhausting the ship's fuel supplies. This net gain extends to forward impulse as well. A ship powered by anti-protons anti can coast temporarily using the Helios to reach an inferior but highly sustainable speed. Such, effi such effi efficiency lowers anti-proton consumption, a constant concern for any warship. When a Helios propelled ship must refuel, however, it typically, typically relies on a large carrier or nearby planetary factory to synthesize the metallic hydrogen. This process uses extremely dense mass effect fields to create the metal under pressures of over a million Earth's atmospheres. Jesus! Um, a million? Is that even possible? An activity most safely done while planetside. While that process may seem like a drawback compared to skimmer ships, that can, gather, that can gather hydrogen and oxygen from anywhere in the universe. The combat superiority of the Helios maneuvering capabili <laughs> capabilities is often a, worth a worthwhile trade-off. The same efficiency that allows for microburn course correction can power rapid bursts of motion. Once the pilot becomes used to the ship's new energetic responses, she can easily put the ship whatever and at whatever angle she desires. Space Combat Planetary Assaults Planetary assaults are complicated if the target is able to guard the world. The attackers cannot approach the defenders straight on. The Citadel Conventions prohibit the use of large kinetic impactors against habitable worlds in a straight-on attack any misses plow into the planet behind the defending fleet. If the defenders position themselves between the, the attackers and the planet, they can fire at will while the attacker risks hitting the planets. S successful assaults on garden worlds hinge upon up-to-date intelligence. Attackers need to determine where the enemy's defenses are, so they may approach from an angle that allows them to fire with no danger of collateral damage. Note, this is not necessary for hostile worlds. 
Once control of orbit has been lost, defensive garrisons disperse into the wilderness. An enemy with orbital superiority can bombard surface forces with impunity. Thus, the best option for defenders is to hide and collect reconnaissance in, in, in anticipation of relief forces. Given the size of a planet, it is impractical to garrison entire conquered worlds. Fortunately, colonization efforts tend to focus on building up a dozen or fewer areas. Ground forces occupy the spaceports, industrial facilities, and major population centers. The wilderness is patrolled by unmanned aero vehicles and satellite reconnaissance. If a defender unit is spotted, air, mo air mobile rapid deployment units and satellite artillery are used to pin down and destroy them. Yeah, you don't. You never have the numbers to occupy a full planet. Never. Unless you are on uh, the billions, and even so, hundreds of billions. Next. Space combat pursuit tactics. Dependent on light, sensors cannot detect objects mo moving at faster than light speed. No ship can be detected at interstellar ranges. Detection at interplanetary ranges suffers from light speed lag. Observers see ships not where they appear to be, but where they were when the light bearing their image left them, minutes, hours or days before. To counteract light speed lag, battle fleets surround themselves with spheres of screening and scouting frigates. Pursuer pursuers cannot detect ships and directly intercept them. Instead, pursuers track where objects were, where they were heading and at what speed they were moving. Such data reliably predicts an object's future location and for pursuit along its light lagged wake. Ships trying to evade pursuit follow erratic zigzag courses, requiring pursuers to make stops to update their projections. Yeah, you never run on a straight line. Next. Space combat trans relay assaults. The crucial choice for any attack through mass relays is how to divide the fleet for transit. The accuracy of a re relay's mass projection depends on the mass being moved and how far it's going. Any long distance and or high mass jump will see drift. That is, a ship may be hundreds of or millions of kilometers from its intended drop point in any direction from the relay. Distance can be chosen by annuals, but the relays told how much mass to transit. For example, if told to, if told to move a million metric tons of mass, the relay will scan the, appro the approach corridor, find four to 250,000 ton freighters, freighters and transit them together, maintaining their rel rel relative position. Commander has the option of moving his fleet at, as one large, coherent formation that may be widely off position, or breaking it up into many smaller formations that will be individually closer to the intended attack point, but could be widely dispersed. Conservative assault doctrine holds that fleets should be moved en masse, maintaining concentration of force and reducing the changes of collision. The only time it is reasonable to slip, split up a formation is during blockade running. Right. Starships carriers. All races provide their fleets with organic fighter support. Cruisers fit a handful in the space between the interior pressure hulls and exterior armor. Dreadnoughts have a hangar deck without, with, within the hull. Humans, who had only recently graduated from surface to space combat, were the first to build ships building fighters as a main armament. In fleet combat, carriers stay clear of battle, launching fighters bearing disrupted torpedoes. Fighters are the primary striking power of the ship. If a carrier enters mass acceleration range of the enemy, things have gone very wrong. It is possible to recover and rearm fighters during combat though most carriers seal the flight deck and try to stay out of the way. The flight deck is essentially a corridor through the armor and into the heart of the vessel. 
a single well-placed torpedo is enough to gut a carrier. Alliance carriers are named after great leaders, artists and intellectuals from human history. Mass accelerators weapons. Mass accelerators propel solid metal slugs via electromagnetic attraction and repulsion. A slug lightened by a mass effect field can be accelerated to extremely high speeds, promoting pre per permitting, permitting previously unattainable projectile velocities. The primary determinant of a mass accelerator's destructive power is length. The longer the barrel, the longer the slug can be accelerated, the higher the slug's final velocity and therefore the greater its kinetic impact. Slugs are designed to squash or shatter on impact, increasing the energy they transfer to its target. Without collapsing, slugs will punch through their targets while inflicting only minimal damage. Rather than being mounted on exterior, starship guns are housed inside holes and visible only as gun portals from outside. A ship's main gun is a large spinal mount weapon running 90% of the hull's length. While possessing destructive power equal to that of the tactical nuclear weapons, main guns are difficult to aim, because ships must be able to point their bows almost directly as their targets. Main guns are best used for large-range bombardment fire. Approximately 40% of the hulls with broadside guns inflict less damage and can be mounted with greater numbers and more flexibility. The modern human Kilimanjaro class dreadnoughts mount three decks with 26 broadside accelerators apiece for a total salvo weight of 78 slugs per side, firing once every two seconds. However, mass accelerators produce recoil equal to their impact energy. While the mass effect fields suspending the round mitigate the recoil, Recoil shock can still rattle crews and damage systems. So, spaceships become the new 1700s ships that use cannons as a broadside instead of directly in front for this type of ship. Now we go for technology. Wait, did I read? The special vehicle, the Hammerhead? I don't think so. No, I know. The M. I hate it. The M44 a Hammerhead Infantry Fighting Vehicle is a highly maneuverable, mass effect assisted armored vehicle. Using three solid fuel rocket thrusters instead of wheels, the Hammerhead hovers over the battlefield, over the battlefield at up to 120 km per hour, allowing it to maintain formation with swift armored units skim across calm water and even leap terrain obstacles, backup micro boosters guarantee locomotion. So even destruction of two main thrusters leaves the vehicle capable of full mobility. The Hammerhead retains most features of interplanetary fighting vehicles, an, air an airtight interior, 360 degree kinetic barriers and a guided missile system ensuring accuracy during even aggressive maneuvering. Its electronic countermeasures extend to later detection, chef active, chef active thermal masking, masking, and ground penetrating weapon sniffing radar weapon sniffing. The Hammerhead's navigation control emulates that of tanks, so tank drivers can operate Hammerheads without additional training. Factory issue Hammerheads therefore have no altimeter or similar sensors and are best used as the standard cruising altitude, 2 meters of the ground. Uh, okay. Technology. The Argus Planet Scan Technology. The Argus provides a quad qualitative leap in planetary surface Im imaging. Propri a proprietary Technology of the Aindroin, Aindroin Group, an R&D laboratory reportedly owned by Cerberus. This upgrade for Normandy, Normandy sensory 
array delivers superior long-range topographical scanning, resolution, and rendering speed. By deploying an orbital multitask grid of 100 radar emitting microsatellites, the Argus quickly delivers a global digital elevation model DEM, at 50 meters per pixel MPP. Meters per pixel. Resolution. Vastly outclassing the Normandy's previous scanner peak performance of 20, 27 meters per pixel. Such imaging quality provides superior defensive intelligence and at a speed warranted by the dangers of, co of combat. At slower scanning and rendering speed, the Argus can resolve down to a astonishing 0.001 MPP, 1 mm per pixel, ideal for geological and biological perspective, archae archaeological research, and long-term security, security surveillance. By employing such a massive multitask grid of nearly untraceable microemitters, the resilient Argus is virtually invulnerable to electronic countermeasures. The spherical geometry of the Argus grid also allows superior cross-section of targets. Next. Life as a biotic. Biotics. Biotics possess extra extraordinary abilities, but they must live with minor inconveniences. The most obvious issue is getting adequate nutrition. Creating biotic mass effects takes such a toll on met meto metabolism that active biotics develop ravenous that active biotics develop ravenous appetites. The standard alliance combat ration for a soldier is 3,000 calories per day. Biotics are given 4,500, as well as a canteen of potent energy drink for quick refreshment after hard com combat. Another issue is electric charge. Electricity accumulated in Starship Drive course must be discharged, and so must be must the electricity in the biotic user. Biotics are used are prone to small static discharges when, discharges when they touch touch metal. Unfortunately, human biotics also face suspicion and persecution, beginning with the popular misconception that they can read and control minds. Ugh. Biotics symbolize the dehumanization of mankind to people philosophically, philosophically or religiously opposed to gene modification and cybernetics. Militaries are the only organizations that always welcome biotics, offering them huge recruitment incentives. That's a sad thing, when only the, the army accepts you. PC Haptic is it? PC Haptics. I guess that's not for now. Maybe it's another entry that has yet to come. Drones. Drones are small robots used to support and supplement organic soldiers on the battlefield. They have no artificial intelligence of any kind, but follow fixed, minimally adaptive programs. Most varieties employ mass effect levitation to improve mobility. All modern arm armies rely on veritable fleets of drones for routine soldiering, static garrisons, patrols, etc. The use of drones in non-critical non-critical duties keeps manpower needs down and reduces casualties in low intensity conflicts. Less advanced races and cultures with less sensitive to casualties have correspondingly fewer drones in their inventory. Drones are of little use in conventional open field battles as they are poorly armed and armored. In addition to combat with drones, support drones are used to assist organic units in the field. Reconnaissance drones are small, stealth, excuse me, stealthy craft that screen combat units in the field and warn commanders when enemies are spotted. Electronic warfare drones supplement battlefield technicians, serving as mobile jammers and 
electronic intelligence gathering platforms. Huh. Military and civilian police military and civilian police utilize dazzler drones equipped with powerful strobe lights strobe lights to disorient and subdue intruders using non lethal force. Drone formations are officially referred as wings, i.e. deploy the force assault drone wing on the left flank. Common soldiers also refer, refer, refer to friendly formations as flocks and enemy formations as swarms. Makes sense. Security mechs. The deaths of thousands of security and military personnel in the Battle of the Citadel was a loss felt throughout the galaxy, as large numbers of the qualified personnel transferred to the Citadel to replace those that died, short-handed security companies filled out their numbers with large-scale use of unmanned security robots. Commonly, ref commonly referred to as mechs, the security robots are typically grouped into light and heavy varieties. Light mechs come in a variety of sizes but are easily distinguished by opposable digits that help them in their versatile security roles. Heavy mechs lack digits and are simply weapon platforms intended to keep the peace in high threat areas. The quadruple, p the quadruple dog, the quadruple, the quadrupedal, quadrupedal dog mech has a face composed of contraband detection sensors and it stood its arm in case of a perpetrator resists arrest. A typical security mech has, a extremely, has an extremely limited virtual intelligence. Its duty is straightforward and narrow, usually to guard an area, run a friend or foe program to halt unauthorized access, and fire a set of pre-recorded voice commands to warn troublemakers away from the area. Light security mechs are equipped with irritant sprays and electroshockers to force compliance, and heavy mechs may be outfitted with flashbang stunners for similar purposes. When facing an opponent armed with a firearm, any mech will immediately resort to lethal anti-personal weapons to neutralize the threat. If the situation turns violent rapidly enough, it may not even use its warning. Security mechs are frowned upon for actual mil military duty. Though tough enough to survive most firefights, their VI simply does not have the programming to plan an ambush, rescue an os a hostage, hostage, treat a wound, or any of countless other objectives that a soldier must be able to perform on the fly. Yep. Sounds right. The Master Chief, Kasumi's Secrets. Nice, nice. Grey boxes. A um, mnemonic neuro recall stimulator, also known as a grey box, is a device implanted in the brain. Okay, just checking. It's a device, de device implanted in the brain to assist and prioritize memory. Originally developed to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Grey boxes function, function by helping the amygdala, the amygdala chunk incoming stimuli into recognizable pieces for memory consolidation. Each memory is assigned a shape or sensation from other memories, tying the concepts together into a block that is more easily recalled. When, synth when synthetic insights first released them onto the market in 2140, Grey boxes were hailed as a way humans could level the playing field between themselves and the Salarians, whose natural eidic memories gave them an advantage. However, because the implant procedures of a grey box requires the brain to irre irre irreversibly shift its workload over to the machine, software bugs or attempted removal of the grey box for maintenance purpose could lead to incapac incapacitating brain damage. For this reason, Grey boxes soon became used only for those with the dire need for photographic memories, such as researchers and spies. In 2175, 
sale and implantation of grey boxes were outlawed by the Systems Alliance following an incident with Abraham Rumoy, an employee of the Alliance Intelligence Agency. Rumoy was believed to be a professional conman and thief named Keiji Okuda, who accessed and sold classified da da data. However, prosecuting attorneys, attorneys were unable to use his assisted memories as evidence due to the Alliance court system's prohibitions against self-incrimination based on the Fifth Amendment of the old U.S. Constitution. Rumoy soon disappeared off the map following his trial, further heightening suspicion that he was Okuda and living, and living off of ill-gotten gains. When found outside a human he head, Grey boxes are usually assessed with a specialized reader. A separate decryption key is almost always required, as users with data sensitive enough to require a grey box invariably reinstall their own encryption. CASA Fabrications Locust The gun that killed two presidents is the infamous legacy of the CASA Fabrications Model 12 Locust, originally created for the Systems Alliance who wanted a lightweight weapon for high-gravity worlds. The Locust was de designed to overcome the limitations of traditional submachine guns at long range. With bullet velocity of modern weapons already pushed to the limit, the Locust designers sought a way to improve accuracy through reducing weapon kick. They created an internal floating bed that absorbs the gun's recoil with minimal jarring of the gun frame itself. The barrel, magazine, chamber and operating mechanism all move within this bed, it absorbs, which absorbs shock with springs and buffers. This creates a platform stable enough that the Locust can use auto-targeting software usually reserved for match-grade weapons. The Locust lethality on shielded targets has been amply demonstrated. In 2176, a Virginian patent clerk named Michael Moser Lang brought the Locust concealed in a sh shoulder-mounted video camera to a photo opportunity between Enrique Aguilar, President of the United North American States, and Chinese People's Federation Premier Ying Zhong. At a distance of, 25, uh, of about 25 meters, Lang pierced the connective barriers covering the stage with the, the, with the first burst, and when Zhong heroically tackled Aguilar to remove him from the line of fire, Lang's succeeding burst went through the Premier's body and fatally bo wounded both men. Dono Donovan Hawk's collection contained two antric ivory handle locusts, modified to take thermal clips. A detachable data drive rests in the lining of the box, containing Omnitool specifications for, fabri for fabricating, fabricating copies. A quick trip to the Exonet reveals one of the weapons has the same serial number as Lang's original. If it's fake, it's extremely well made. Lady Liberty! This I'm really curious about. The Statue of Liberty was a target of several terrorist attacks over its 210 year lifetime. But in 2096, a multi group called Freedom First finally brought the statue down. Protesting the induction of Canada and Mexico into, into the United North American States, the New York chapter of Freedoms First wanted a symbol that they would succeed from this new union if necessary. In the early morning hours of November the 1st, they smuggled small arms and 15.5 tons of high explosives onto Liberty Island, shooting or capturing the guards. They planned the explosives under the pedestal and detonated them at 7.37 a.m. The statue crashed to the ground in pieces, unexpectedly killing four of the Freedom First terrorists. The remaining team members were apprehended after long manhunts, but the damage was done. The outrage at the section... The session, the The secessionists kindled the fires of the Second American Civil War. On November the 4th, President Kaitlyn Chung signed an execute, 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 uh, execute. Uh, I'm I'm dying. An 
executive order to rebuild the statue, approximately one-tenth of the steel beams and copper plating from the destroyed statue was recovered and used in creating the new one. The original's head was put on display at the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. It remained there for two years until the Battle of Washington. During heavy shelling by secessionist forces, the head disappeared. A new statue was completed in 2101, and the fate of the original pieces was left for speculation in pulp novels. Interest flared up briefly in 2159 when photos resurfaced of the head in the cargo hold of the Star Freighter, but by that time, human media was far more concerned with the future. In the face of humanity spreading him out among thousands of new planets, a statue titled Liberty Enlightening the World seemed small and quaint by comparison. Yeah. That's true. That's interesting. That's a nice story, actually. I was really curious about this, and uh, I gotta say, it's not disappointing. A second civil war, secessionist forces, a new state, planet, Beckenstein. More glittering than diamonds, more expensive than surgery. It's how travel agents describe this planet behind closed doors. Given the opportunity to colonize planets after the first contact war, the Systems Alliance chose Beckenstein to be their trading arm, producing goods to be sold on the nearby, nearby citadel. Cracking the vast galactic marketplace proved difficult. The first human product sold on novelty alone, then lack of demand, hit Beckenstein's economy hard. Only in the second generation of colonists did the planet find a sustainable niche in high quality entertainment and luxury goods. Once brand over awareness sunk in, aliens flocked to Beckenstein's many spaceports. The planet today boasts more millionaires and billionaires per capita than, per capita than ad, any other human colony. Though its crime tend to be white collar and non violent, Beckenstein is not without its dark side. Both its suicide rate and inflation are extremely high compared to other worlds. Unemploy unemployment is artificially low because few people immigrate to the expensive planet without having a job lying in, lined up. And the cost of living is so great that unemployed workers typically leave for kinder planets after just a few months. Those who stay see themselves as tougher, sharper and more skillful than the rest, as well as capable of getting respect and employment on any on any lesser planet. As the popular song says, if you can make it on the back, you got him in a you got him by the neck. Okay. I guess Beckenstein is the planet where the uh, arms dealer or whoever was living, I suppose. The veterans, I eat secrets. Great. The M451 Firestorm Flamethrower is a product of human ingenuity, ruthlessness, and industrial espionage. Its origin dates back to the 2160s, when human colonists to new planets used flamethrowers to clear vegetation or ice. The fuels perform erratically on planets with extremely cold temperatures and differing air compositions from Earth. Realizing this could be a problem for military units, Systems Alliance intelligence operatives stole the Turian design for the Hyeras flamethrower, a battle test workhorse that functioned, functioned in nearly every environment. The result was a Firestorm, an anti-personal and anti-armor flame unit that can accept a variety of liquid fuels. The Turian design used low-octane hydrocarbons thickened with denture oil which is taken from large marine animals similar to Earth's whales. Humans then reverse-engineered a synthetic composite with almost identical properties that could be fabricated from heavy weapon fuel cells using an Omni-Tool. The result is a sticky spray that burns at, ap at ap approx approximately 1600 degrees Celsius, a less intense fire than plasma weapons, but covering a significant wider target area. Adding to the trauma is the shocking smoke produced by the spray, and if the, targets, and if the target's armor is breached, the fires quickly consume the oxygen within. 
The Firestorm may not be the most efficient weapon in Systems Alliance Arsenal, but the sheer ugliness of how it kills ensures it is the most feared. Okay. Mercenaries Blue Sun's Full History Founded in 2160 by the human mercenaries Aid Masani and Vido Santiago, the Blue Suns were initially a Skillian Verge protection racket. As they expanded in numbers and influence, the two co-founders disagreed vehemently on many issues. Finally, after arguing about whether to recruit the slave trading batterians into their ranks, Vidu, Vidu ambushed Zaid and shot him in the head. Believing Zaid dead, Vidu took full control of the Blue Suns and hired whatever batterians he pleased. Soon he had crowned one named Solen Dalserach as titular head of the operations. It was a move designated to placa placate his battalion investors and draw fire from would-be assassins. It worked on both counts, and the partnership has less to this day. Over the decades, the Suns grew into the fearsome combat force spanning dozens of planets in Citadel space. The Verge and the Terminus systems the Verge and the Terminus systems. Knowing that the goal logistical team is key to fielding an army, Vedo diversified the Suns, selling arms, training and supplies as often as taking contracts to crack skulls. Even when the Suns suffered heavy losses, Vedo's entrepreneurial expertise ensured new recruits could replace the old. All that was lost when was the all that was lost was the truth. Today, only a handful of trusted mercs even know who Vito Santiago is, let alone his old partner Zaid. Planet Zoria Ring firearms and antihistamines is what veteran guides say about this lush garden world. First colonized in 2160, Zoria Zoraya's temper temperate and tropical zones are overrun with plants and fungi of all kinds. As a result, the air is mo in most habitable areas is choked with pollen and spores that range from benign to deadly. The scattered colonies across the planet have resorted to clear cutting and slash and burn farming to create habitable, habitable zones, and the more rural areas, where the spores are thickest, are populated only by vorture. Lax eco ecological laws allow mining, mining and manufacturing industries to flourish and pollute cheaply, as the planet's carrying cap capacity far outstrips the current size of its colonies. Zoria is also home to the Blue Suns mercenary company, who dominate the colony's security forces. The Suns enjoy nearly unlimited influence with local po politicians and judges, ensuring no other private military contractors can compete with them economically. Nearly every colony has a Suns recruiting station. If not a training camp, though, this was hardly made the planet any safer. Piracy, drugs and vice and political violence are commonplace. Okay. Now weapons, armor and equipment and some of them a mass accelerator pro propels a solid metal slug using precisely controlled electromagnetic attraction and repulsion. The slug is designed to squash on sh or shatter on impact, increasing the energy transfers to the target. If this were not the case, it would simply punch a hole right through, doing minimal damage. An uh, accelerated design was rev 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 revolutionized by element zero. A slug lightened by a mass effect field can be accelerated to greater speeds, permitting proje projectile velocities that were previously unattainable. If accelerated to a high enough velocity, a simple paint ship can impact with the same destructive force as a nuclear weapon. However, mass accelerators produce recoil equal to their in impact energy. This is mitigated somewhat by the mass effect fields that rounds are suspended within, but weapon recoil is still the prime limited factor on slot velocity. Alright, and that is all for now. In the Codex primary and secondary, all was 
view all was red there will be probably another entries later in the game and we will deal with them as they come not as they come at a certain time we will wrap it up everything and for now let me just save and for now i want to thank you for joining me here at this boring long codex entry reading but still part of the game and i want to thank you for joining me here and i'll see you again next time in this gaming gatehouse